My name is John Taylor, and I want to read to you the opening seven verses of Isaiah chapter 43. This is how it reads. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead. Since you are precious and honoured in my sight, and because I love you, I will give men in exchange for you and people in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. I have to say that I've been living with this passage from Isaiah 43 for the best part of 60 years. It was not my choice, but when I left home as a young man to go into the Royal Air Force for my national service, the young people's group in the church in Watford sent me on my way with the words of this chapter ringing in my ears. Fear not, I have redeemed you. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. What I needed was assurance. And these words did give me the reassurance that enabled me to go out to others in the knowledge that God was with me and was guarding what an older generation of devotional writers used to call the inner citadel of the soul. I'm sure that I hardly need to remind you of the background to these chapters from Isaiah, but a a few brush strokes may help. The people of Jerusalem and Judah have been in exile for the better part of half a century. Their humiliation has been devastating. Not only do they have to eke out a living in virtual internment conditions in Babylonia, but all their hopes for a speedy return home have been dashed. More than that, Their holy city, God's holy city, Jerusalem, had been totally destroyed and burnt to the ground. And to them, that meant that their God had been resoundingly defeated. In exile in Babylon, they were surrounded with the splendid trappings of a seemingly altogether superior God, with massive idols, temples, the famous highway of the gods and the even more famous hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the wonders of the ancient world. Understandably, they felt defeated, dejected, deserted. Then came the good news of Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. And cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Enough is enough. The end is nigh. Your God is not like an idol. He is the incomparable God. To whom then will you liken God? Before him the nations are like a drop in a bucket. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, and you, Israel, are his servant. But it's not all flattery. In chapter 41, the message oscillates between Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, and the much less attractive, you worm, Jacob. And who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger whom I send? He sees but does not observe. His eyes are open, 
but he does not hear. So here is the picture of God's people at one and the same time special to God and yet failures because they don't fulfill their divine calling. They are blind and deaf. And this chapter 43 continues that oscillation. Verses 1 to 7 are speak about the redeemed people of God. And then verses 8 to 12 about the blind and deaf witnesses that they are. Now, I haven't needed to be reminded of my propensity to failure. So for today's purposes, I'd like to stick with verses 1 to 7, if I may. Here we have the redeemed people. Verse 1. I was always taught that the most important words in a sentence are the verbs. Verse 1 tells us what God has done. This is what the Lord says, He who created you, He who formed you, I have redeemed you, I have summoned you by name. Four verbs. Take them one by one. I have created you. The word created is a rare word. It's only used in Genesis chapter 1 and a few other places. It's always God creating. Creating man and woman. Occasionally creating something else, special. But it's God's handiwork. And when God says, I have created you, he's saying to us, you are my handiwork. We don't create, only God does. And it's God who has made us and placed us on this earth. We are his handiwork. Then the word formed. This is the word yatsar in Hebrew. The word means to mould, as it were, to work in plasticine, to shape. It describes the action of the potter, moulding the clay with care and with good intention. And God has made us the kind of people we are with our foibles and characteristics. I'm rather saddened when I come across people who bitterly regret the kind of people they are. They wish they could be someone else. It's a real mark of grace to be able to accept the fact that God puts us on earth for a purpose and made us the shape we are also for a purpose. Created and formed. Then the word redeemed. Well, that's well known to many people. Go ail, the work of the next of kin, the redeemer, whose statutory duty it was to protect your interests at every turn. So if you fall into debt, the go ail, the redeemer, stands surety for you. If you're enslaved, the redeemer gets you out of it. If you're deprived of your possessions, the redeemer buys them back for you. And if you're killed by someone, the Redeemer's first task is to avenge your death. You are the Redeemer's prime concern and responsibility. In much the same way, we are God's prime concern and responsibility. And then the fourth verb, called by name. This can either mean given you a name, and so represents the relationship of parent to child, hence you are mine, or summoned you by name in a setting of commissioning to be God's witnesses. Either translation will do. Maybe the ambiguity was deliberate. So much for what God has done for his people in verse 1 of Isaiah 43. Now in verse 2, we're told what he will do. When you pass through the waters, when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Here, in my judgment, the most important word is not a verb. It's one of the smallest words. Note that the prophet says, when, not if. There is a, this is a promise in relation to certain facts, not about potential possibilities. There is no way to avoid completely the flood waters or the fires. You may prefer to be free of them, as I do, but they are there as the inevitable accompaniments of the human condition. But God's promise is twofold. One, I will be with you 
as you go through these difficulties. And two, they will never overwhelm you. There'll be limits on their powers. God's presence and God's controlling grace make the sufferings of this life bearable. It will be tough. It may be unpleasant, but it will not be the end. God doesn't offer us the hope that he will make the problems disappear. He doesn't offer to help us withdraw from the battle. The battle has to be joined, but he will be there alongside us. And he will limit its scope. The enemy is not going to be all-conquering. There is a thus far and no further about his influence to harm us just as God set a limit on what Satan could do to Job in his sufferings. And precisely the same point is made by the Apostle Paul in that famous verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. And God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your strength, but with the temptation will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Then verse 3, why will God do this for his people? Because he says, I am the Lord your God. You haven't chosen me, but I have chosen you. I am Israel's Holy One, bound to them in a special relationship of covenant and commitment. I am your Saviour. The Saviour doesn't cramp you, but frees you liberates you. That's what saviour means. Gives you space to move and to think and to serve. And you, in the words of the lady on the L'Oreal advert, are worth it. The Lord would give half Africa for you, says Isaiah, because you are precious, honoured, and I love you. Now that is a most astonishing statement put into the mouth of God. It's almost unique in the Old Testament. I love you. Listen to God saying it. I have tika. It only comes twice in the whole of the Old Testament. Yes, I love you generally, plural, but this is you personally. I have tika. I love you. The other passage is Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Yes, I know God loves us and of course we believe it, but just occasionally he actually puts it into words and declares his love to us as he does here. I may be an old softy, but I find that profoundly moving. After all, that little phrase, I love you, is the key word that unlocks the gates of affection and intimacy between a man and his wife. It's part of the language of lovers, and here it's taken up by God to express his feelings for Israel and for every one of the people who belong to him. And finally, in verses 6 and 7, the Lord signs off with his promise to bring his people home. However far they may have strayed, whether by accident or by intention, whether by war or exile, he will bring them home to a homecoming reminiscent of the return of the prodigal son. And to identify himself as Israel's God, our God, he concludes with the wraparound, so typical of Isaiah, with three out of those four verbs that began the prophecy, called by name, created, formed, and made. This is the finale, and what a finale, of God's reassuring word that I've lived by most of my life.